Good day, viewers. Welcome to a new edition of 30 Minutes with me, Manir Dan Ali. Our guest today is a lawyer, a minister of the Federal Republic between 1993 to 1998, and also the Waziri of Duse. And he's currently the chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Adewa Consultative Forum, better known as ACF. I'm here talking about Al Haji Bashir Al Hatu. Welcome to 30 Minutes. Thank you very much. I don't know if we can start from your recent meeting, I mean, in your current capacity as the chair of the Board of Trustees of the ACF. Um, what exactly is happening with it? Is this a sort of renewal that we've seen you come out to actually apologize to people in the north that maybe is it the elites that have failed northerners and maybe Nigerians in general? Why do you have to do that? Well, the recent meeting on the 4th of September in Kaduna was necessitated by the fact that uh, we have realized that the conditions of us in the north uh, has become very dire and continues to deteriorate and that uh, something very urgent uh, is needed to be done uh, to at least uh, slow or stop the continuous deterioration into a much worse condition and that uh, if that is not done quickly, immediately, then maybe uh, our, our, all our collective existence may be threatened. Okay, it's even an existential problem as you see it. Absolutely, because uh, if you remember 15, 16 years ago, the North was quiet, was peaceful, was uh, busy, doing uh, people were uh, going about their businesses, then the Boko Haram appeared. And uh, people thought it was going to be a very temporary thing. It, uh, it, it has dropped on for contrary. more than a decade. It has gone on for 15 years now. Uh, Ten years ago, there was not a single bandit in Northwest. Now, they are everywhere. So we are very seriously frightened about the prospect of the growth of all this uh, a negative uh, and uh, security situation and therefore it was necessary to meet collecting all the leaders of the north so from various uh, uh, aspects of life people who have a lot of experience in various fields to come and share ideas and then conclude on what we need to do immediately but you are all like x this x that big men of yesteryears you are not currently in government beyond talking what exactly can you do well you are right but uh, beyond talking we will approach those in authority those who have uh, both executive and legislative powers and uh, indicate to them our position and ask them to do something more than what they are doing at the moment because what is being done at the moment does not seem to take care of the problem. So we need to talk to those uh, in authority and bring the urgency of the matter to them and also uh, keep pressuring for a faster, quicker, and even maybe more different approaches to all these, as, uh, all these problems that we are facing. I've seen that even recently General Theophilus Danjuma, former Minister of Defense, former Chief of Army Staff, was more or less chiding the military, the security forces, and saying that there is no excuse for not bringing an end to all this insecurity. Do you share that view? Absolutely. General Danjuma, of course, we, as we all know, is a very well-respected general. Uh, he was also part of the army that had uh, uh, committed and was involved with the civil war in Nigeria and uh, had uh, quickly taken care of it within three years, the beginning of civil law. These skirmishes around our villages shouldn't be as serious as a civil war, 
but somehow it has continued to grow and uh, prosper and we seem continually looking and able then, uh, to, to take care of the situation. It appears that what is called the war economy has more or less grown, which is almost everybody is involved. I've seen the governor of Kasena accusing some district heads, village heads of taking money to look the other way while the bandits kill their own subjects. We've had accusations against the security forces of also being on the tech from the bandits. We've had people who say they delivered ransom to bandits with the direction of, I mean, after passing military checkpoints who more or less say to them that is the way to go or this other way. And ordinary people are also informers in their own communities. What can you do? Is it just force? What can you do to bring an end this kind of war economy where everybody is involved and more and more lives are being lost? Well, the truth is actually the thing has become an industry. You are right. But uh, uh, I am hoping and I think it is true that uh, these individual uh, negative elements within our communities are a minute minority. And what we are hoping that the examples that have been shown by arrest and detention and the trial and uh, commitment will deter some people. But we on our own, we will continue to educate people, to sensitize the, uh, the society on the negative aspect of these, uh, these uh, ills for them to come back to our senses. Because unless we do that and do that very quickly, uh, nobody can predict how, how much trouble uh, this region is going to go into. Recently, the military was kind of celebrating the success of the, over the elimination of one of the kingpins, that is Halilu Sububu. But the Bell Liturgies, the Dogo Gites, the Ado Alerus, and hundreds of other such bandit kingpins are free. We hear they are even moving away from where the military have been concentrated on recent. Why do you think it's impossible for a simultaneous operation to be carried out to deal with the problem? It's all what uh, is amazing, really, for us that are not in the military or in the security or the security uh, population. This is the most amazing aspect of it. This is a military that had, uh, like I mentioned, it was in the civil law and was very, very successful. This military has gone all over the world and it has test, uh, uh, it's a tested military and uh, very well respected all over the world. But somehow uh, it has become uh, incapable, seemingly, of handling this kind of uh, aspect. But we are hoping that they will have to now think of something different. We have been advocating for a change of, uh, because so far, as I understand it, they have been on the defensive. So it's now time, I think, for us to take the war to these people, go on the offensive. We have the, the experience in the military and the police and the security agencies to handle this matter. I think they have to have a coordination and co uh, consensus of uh, opinion, operational uh, uh, guidance for them to succeed. Um, uh, the, the, the bandits keep growing uh, uh, more and more uh, Bolder. belligerent yeah. and bold. But you remember Abu Bakr Sheikha was doing the same? And uh, in the end, uh, he is no longer around. It's, so we are hoping the success they had with this Buzu will encourage them further to pursue the rest of them and uh, get this thing done as soon as possible. But there is also the small issue of the police who are supposed to be in charge of internal security. The military are dragged in because the problem appears to be beyond the capabilities of the police. There doesn't be, appear to be a concerted effort to change the Nigerian policing architecture in terms of numbers, in terms of training, in terms of approaches. Some say that actually, yes, it is 
sometimes the police even hinder that they free some of the captured bandits and what have you. So are we neglecting that area of the problem? I think there is also the problem of orientation and attitude of the police. Recently I read in the newspapers, is not more than seven days ago, that the governor of uh, Katsina State was complaining that uh, about 20 villages were policed uh, by about 30 policemen. 20 villages under the circumstances of this banditry. And then on the same news, in the same newspaper, another page, I read that the IG was sending 36,000 policemen to Edo for an election. So we can see the priorities, the are, priorities are absolutely uh, wrong and different. And uh, I think the sooner we give the security utmost priority, the better. But some people are even questioning all these numbers being thrown around elections. That where are the 35,000 to take to an election in Edo? Probably it's just been hyped up for some allowances, purposes or so. In reality, we've seen the numbers are still inadequate for the population of Nigeria. Yet government wait and watch while there is bickering between the inspector generals of police and the police service commission over who has the right to even recruit new intakes. Well, all that is part of the Nigerian problem. I think the police, uh, whether it is 36,000 or 10,000 or whatever, taking whatever number, huge number, into a state for a day's job, uh, it compares very badly with the fact that uh, for 20 villages under the siege of bandits, you have only 30 policemen. Uh, the internal uh, wrangling between the Police Service Commission and the IG's office had been going on for quite a while, but it's all part of the Nigerian problem. Uh, they don't, uh, we don't take care of things immediately. We allow them to grow until they burst in our face, and everybody is worse for it. But do we allow this kind of bickering to hinder a big national issue, that is the under-policing, and uh, you just watch two institutions failing to carry out instructions of the president? Well, we appear to have allowed it to fester for quite a while now. I think it is now time for government to look into it very seriously and take immediate action to bring it to a halt so that other more urgent uh, uh, demands of the police service should be, uh, could be tackled immediately. I've seen some governors in exasperation about the problem, encouraging communities to take up arms against the bandits and protect themselves and fight the bandits. Is that a feasible alternative? Well, part of our own, from the ACA point of view, part of the aspects that we believe the police can begin to look at, really, is that these are volunteer forces that have been created by the states could actually be trained and converted into some paramilitary uh, force and given weapons, proper weapons, proper training and proper tactics and techniques so that they can actually uh, complement the, uh, the, the, the efforts of the army, army and the police. Uh, we think that uh, the, those boys on the ground know the ground far better than the police or the military and they will be able to assist them. But there is no point at, uh, pushing these, uh, these, uh, these boys into the bush and armed or armed with only sticks and uh, dang guns to face that kind of uh, bandits the, with the weapons that we see them carry. So I think the government will do well to look into this aspect of training and, uh, and equipping these young men, volunteers, in order to complement the efforts of the military. So you are like suggesting to learn from the Borno model where Boko Haram was on the ascendancy until the joint uh, task for the JTF, the local communities were integrated into the fight against the Boko Haram elements because they know them, they live within their communities and they know the terrain better as you did say. So that is what appeared to have turned the tide against Boko Haram. You want similar Absolutely. Thing?
for the banditry. Absolutely. That seems it has worked there. It will work here also in, in the northwest and north central. And we have not yet tried it, but we will try it. But what I'm saying is when you do it, you should also equip this, these children with the same kind of weapons, or even better, so that they can be they can be they can match fire with can, fire exactly but at the moment they are at a very serious disadvantage you push them into the bush they get killed unnecessarily without because they don't carry the same kind of uh, weapons we've just reached that time when we should go for a short break and resume the conversation thereafter Welcome back. It is still 30 minutes, the interactive program of Trust Television. And we are talking about the banditry, the insecurity, and what have you. But it is not the only problem confronting the North. The bigger problem that many people will even say is the current hunger that people are unable to eat thanks to the beginning of the harvest season. It's sort of beginning to ease, but it's still there because many people didn't farm because of insecurity. Many people are the urban poor. They don't have farms to cultivate anything. What could be done to address this problem, especially when many businesses and offices are just closing down because of the harsh economic situation? Well, uh, you have to see our community, our society, our region, from the point of view that uh, the vast majority of us have been trained, uh, whether you are Muslim or Christian, to be charitable. Uh, for the Muslim, you give zakah, you give uh, uh, you, you, you give assistance, uh, you give sadaqa uh, to the poor and the needy. You also come and. Uh, at, uh, you come and think about when government was really, literally doing everything for the northerner. To take the northerner to school free of charge, we give them all sorts of things like... Uh, so our people have grown, I think, to be a bit uh, lethargic and laid back and have in their mind continue to think that government or an individual good man in the society will provide. So a lot of our own people have lost the zeal or the will or the determination to actually look for uh, their own businesses, their own keeps, and uh, establish whatever business or whatever kind of skill they may have in order to feed themselves and their family and keep the dignity of a, of a, of a human being. So we, we have grown very, very unable to fight this uh, attitude and, and it's been growing. If you go to all our towns, uh, villages now, we are becoming town full of beggars, full of people who are looking for food to eat. So government is even realizing that, okay, instead of giving them schools, hospitals, uh, infrastructure, give them palliatives. But how far can palliatives go? And in any case, majority of the people still want to earn an honest living. But the situation, the economic situation, the cost of living is making them to go under in their little businesses. You are right. The pilot will not go far. That's why it is important that our people learn to go back to what we used to be. People of uh, skill, people of industry. When North was very prosperous because everybody was busy, everybody was working, either on the farm or in a, in a company or on his own. But the, all this we have lost out because of so many reasons. First, of course, the insecurity has come, so we cannot even go to the farms. Secondly, um, so many factors have been working against even an individual. Now, the northern... Uh, 
northern uh, uh, prospect has been seriously affected through continuous uh, government budgetary uh, allocation that has been quite negative to us. And that is that has gone on for years and years, and the effect is all now accumulating. But some say that it's not just about the allocation, but the application of whatever little it is. Because some of the problem you are pointing out about people becoming beggarly is because they see that it pays more to be some political uh, supporter rather than to be doing an honest, hard work on the farm or in the shop or in the workshop. So isn't it like partly the government responsible for, and especially some blame the return of politics for all this kind of uh, industry of people doing very little honest work, but being the people with the higher earnings? You are right there because uh, you can trace this problem to the constitution. It's a very idealistic. It thinks the constitution believes that every government official has a, a, there is a, a means of check and balance. Uh, you have the governor, you have the president, but you have the national assembly to make sure that uh, the president does the right thing. In, uh, on the state level, you have the governor, you have the state and uh, to make sure that the governor does the right thing. And you have the judiciary to, to, to be the arbiter. But unfortunately, this, 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 this expectation of the Constitution is not uh, realized at all. In practice, In it's practice, not the case. It's not. The House of Assembly is always at the governor's back and call. The National Assembly is doing the same for the president. So there is that break in... in, in, in uh, even in our consciousness that uh, to do the right thing. So our institutions are failing, that's what you are saying. Very weak institutions are the main problem of this country. Uh, institutions have not been allowed to grow and uh, become really uh, efficient. Uh, but who, who do you blame? Because, you know, in the early days after the return to civil rule, we always were blaming the military. They've been gone for more than 25 years. So who do we blame for the gradual erosion of the independence of the three arms of government? Now they seem to be all in bed together. All of us, I think, including you and I, because uh, the person in power doesn't like challenge of anything. He would rather be able to do what uh, he well went to do. And the person who is supposed to check him would rather enjoy uh, favors from the same person and let the person continue to behave the way he wants to do. So will the rank headed the attitude take us anywhere? That's where we are all groveling before the person in power. This is exactly the reason why we have been going in a circle in this country. We don't seem to be moving forward. We go round and round from one uh, set of rulers to another set of rulers with the same problem has been persisting and uh, it's been growing, unfortunately, even larger by the day. So what do we do now? What does the North do in itself and what do Nigerians do to get out of this quagmire? The North has to start from the household. A Northerner has to now believe that he is himself responsible and accountable for his own action, and also responsible to take care of himself, his family, and therefore needs to find a job, whatever job it is, to sustain his existence. But unfortunately, the northerner would rather uh, produce children and throw them onto the street. So this is what we are advocating for, people to understand that those days must, uh, must be over. gone. They are over now. Um, the, the cracks, our major problem is these children on the streets. So the huge population explosion, you think, is the problem. That is what leads to people abdicating responsibility, sending their children to schools in court when they end up in the streets, more or less, and what have you. And which is why other parts of the country are saying, 
northerners are just breeding children which they cannot support. If they say so, they will be right, actually, because uh, we still have not uh, been able to get our people to understand. Unfortunately, in the north, the least people, the least capable people, unfortunately, are the highest producers of children. And they see sending their own children to this uh, school as uh, some form of religious uh, uh, activity, which is not. So that is this even uh, part of what we are hoping to do is to talk to the ulamas and to make sure that this al system doesn't exist anymore. But it's a very touchy and sensitive subject. Even much of the ulamas seem to want it because that is the source of their power as Absolutely. well and authority. So how do you deal with it? Because some will say you are going against religious injunction. You are saying that uh, we shouldn't give back. Well, you see, the, the, the origin of the al is began when people, uh, when there were no malabs, no, no Islamic teachers in our towns. People have, have, had to travel to Borno to, to say he has gone to Gabas to learn um, uh, Islamic uh, and Quranic uh, uh, education. Uh, education. But now, in every little village, there is a mala capable of teaching these children what they are sent far away to, to do. The sending of, your, of the children far away from home is an irresponsibility of the, of the father because even religiously, he's supposed to be responsible and take care of his child. And if you can have it malam in your own area, there is absolutely no reason whatsoever to send a four, five-year-old child. And these are the same children that have now grown to 10, 15, 16, and are bandits now in the, in the, in the bushes. They have no family ties. They don't have empathy for anything. They have grown with bitterness because they, have, they don't know love. You didn't have know, parental love, yeah. No, nothing. So you, you cannot be shocked that they can kill people and uh, laugh over it. And so we must now teach our people to cut their coat like, according to their size, which we have not been doing, but which uh, I think necessity is now forcing us to do. Uh, I, we will talk to the religious malams. I, am, I have spoken to many. A lot of them are absolutely against it. We are going to have a position that we will bring to the 19 northern governors and tell them that, listen, you have to take drastic action by stopping this. It had been tested before in Kano when... Uh, uh, there was, uh, no, um, the Air Force... Uh, Ndasu, Umaru. Umaru Ndasu. Umaru. Umaru. Well, he under was the governor. military. Yes. yes. He prescribed... Uh, but prescription doesn't usually solve the problem. during his time. Under a military. Yes. So if it could work with the law, it can work any time. When the law the is not being will. observed. Well... Yeah. I know you are a lawyer, but the law is being observed in breaches. Well, I agree with you there. But uh, our people, our leaders, our politicians uh, must now have the political will because 90% of our problem is grown out of this uh, 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 system of uh, not caring of our own children or producing children that we cannot be able to take care of. We cannot educate them, we cannot feed them, we cannot clothe them. Very valid points, though controversial in some cycles, but very good point to end this edition of this program. Thank you very much for coming on to the program. Thank you, Manif. Thank you very much. Viewers, that's the end of this edition of 30 Minutes. Keep edit with us. <laughs>